Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible together out loud, book by book and chapter by chapter. And we're looking at Mark chapter 2. It's so nice to be back in the Gospels. We did the Gospel of John about a year ago, and we've since then seen a bunch in the New Testament, some different letters, a bunch in the Old Testament, uh, some stuff that we saw all the way back in Numbers. I looked at Joshua, I looked at some of the prophetic stuff. Um, we looked at some of the apocalyptic stuff like Daniel, Revelation, Zechariah. Uh, but yeah, we're back in the Gospels. So there's something nice just about, you know, reading the stories of what our Lord uh, did. So uh, here we're looking at Mark chapter 2, and we've got not as many things crammed in as we did in Mark chapter 1, um, but still still a few. Um, you know, it's, it's really, if you had to summarize it, though, it seems like it's our Lord just really getting into this controversy and confrontation with the authorities. Um, it's just really happened very quickly. We saw it already happen in chapter 1, and chapter 2 it just gets more intense. So uh, let's get into the chapter today. Joining us, we've got Pastor Curtis Dieterding, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Good morning, brother. Good to have you with us. How are you guys doing there in Fort Myers? Oh, it's good here. Good to be with you here this morning. Um, uh, everybody here in in our parish, uh, in our church anyway, has uh, been very healthy, very sound um, as we continue to shelter in place. Uh, and it seems to be that way for most of our churches, most of our churches anyway here in the area, uh, as we gather together as pastors online now, uh, kind of sharing with each other how things are going, keeping each other in our in our prayers. Um, trying to also keep those around us in our communities and all the different uh, organizations and things that we work with in our prayers as well. And so, uh, yeah, we're just kind of moving through this time with everyone else around the world. Uh, definitely a different time, isn't it? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I would say so. Yeah, different, different time. Um, and it's just, you know, we've just seen, too, the situation is so fluid so, I mean, we'll see what it's going to be like. You know, I think that a lot of people out here in California are kind of waiting on bated breath for some word of loosening of restrictions, some kind of indication or some kind of date being given. So, you know, I think I think a lot of people are, um, are hoping that we can uh, take a maybe more balanced approach for how we're doing this and not have it be just so kind of, you know, uh, just all things across the board. So... Uh, but yeah, I mean, Lord, Lord willing, um, you know, may, may he grant that, that we can achieve a balance that protects our neighbor, but also, um, also provides for all the needs of people, not merely the, uh, kind of physical ones. So, so I, uh, yeah, I don't, it's in, I don't, in the, I don't know what's, yeah, I don't know what's going on out in California. Um, is there, are, are they, are they beginning to reopen out there? Is that what they're trying to do yet? Are they trying to move into those phases that uh, were hand, handed down by the federal government? Um, any, any kind of opening at all over there? Um, very, very slowly. Uh, I think I read that in Los Angeles, they're, they're starting to loosen some of the restri restrictions. Um, things like golf courses where, people are pretty spread out anyway. <laughs> so, um, some things like that, but, um, yeah, it's, it's very gradual still. And for pretty much for the most part that the state's just still under shelter in place, just, you know, don't go anywhere. Of course it's, it, it's like shelter in place, but then it's just kind of like, you know, people are just kind of like hanging out in like parking lots and, um, you know, walking huh. paths and target. So I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, right. And I, I mean, we're, we're just in the phase of trying to, to reopen. So we've had our beaches open up, our parks are opened up again. Um, we have restaurants that are now, they just, this week, they're just starting to open up you know, 25% capacity. Um, so a lot of it, a lot of the restaurants are trying to do, uh, try to open up to the outside. Uh, because uh, I, I guess they say that, that the virus isn't quite as potent out there in the in the sun and all that. So, 
So they're trying to do more seating and so forth outside. So, yeah, they're they're slowly working into a phase one of a, of a phase uh, three to five um, phase type program here in the state of Florida. So anyway, so that's where we're at. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, thanks for thanks for letting me know. It's um, you know, we just we just keep praying over you know our state and all all, every all the states in our nation and uh speaking of prayer actually as we turn to the text here would you open us up with a prayer for us um for the lord's guidance as we look at this chapter for everyone following along with us and uh just yes for uh our, our nation and for all of our brothers and sisters out there thank you almighty god We come before you calling you mighty because you are the creator of all things and you show your might in so many, so many ways. As we approach your word this day, we see Christ Jesus uh, showing that might and that power again in, uh, in the healing of the paralytic in all that he shows us in, uh, in what it means for us to be trusting and have our faith completely upon you, especially during, during times like these, the times of, of pandemic, that we can uh, truly uh, depend upon you fully, trusting in you uh, to uh, continue to provide for us that what that which we need. Uh, we pray that you would give us extra portions of patience and understanding. That you would help us to keep our eyes open to our neighbors who are hurting during this time, uh, finding ways in which we can reach out to them and help them and bring your love, your care, and your compassion into their lives. Be with us as we see Christ being compassionate, reaching out and touching and healing the lives of those around him in our uh, reading of your word this day, that we might continue to grow also in that same grace which we receive from your Son, Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd, in whose precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, Let's go ahead then and turn to the text, and let's just start by reading it straight on through and uh, just kind of letting the text speak for itself, and then we can come back around and look. We want to, once we start kind of looking at this in detail, we want to look at this, uh, as you were mentioning, this, this first episode, this healing um, which is then followed immediately with controversy. So, uh, but before we start breaking it down and talking about it, let's just get it read first here out loud. We're looking at Mark chapter two here in the English Standard Version. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of his physician, but those who are sick. 
I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding feasts fast? Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. The new from the old and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as, he made their, as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which, is, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. All right, so it's a it's it's a it's a fun chapter. Uh, I mean, it's uh, like, like I was saying, you know, in chapter one, you already had a little bit of uh, the controversy, right? You know, you, you had the um, where was it now? It was uh, is like back in chapter one, the word the word is is co coming out is is getting out about Jesus, right? His fame is spreading. Um, but, you know, as as that happens, they're like, hang on, why is he teaching like this? There's this kind of authority here, right? Um, and and I think it's kind of already there that we get the sense that, hang on, people are not quite ready <laughs> for what Jesus is bringing. And, and I feel like that's really captured here just kind of again and again. Every time he does something, everyone's like, what? Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Why is it like that? Yeah, they were talking about uh, in chapter one, you know, we've never seen that kind of authority, not even among the scribes. Yeah. We've, you know, he's talking about uh, he's spreading this everywhere, all throughout the whole region of Galilee. And uh, it, it's really interesting because when they when it starts off here talking about Capernaum, I, uh, I can actually I can actually see that area in my mind because I've had the opportunity to actually be over there in the Holy Land and be able to see that area and see about where this all took place. And it uh, kind of brings things to light a little bit more to, to know uh, that, you know, how people can easily gather uh, there uh, along the shores and along the Sea of Galilee and uh, where this town was actually located. But, yeah, we see that it's continually increasing this this questioning. This guy's doing something that nobody else has been doing, um, and he's actually bringing healing, and quite a bit of it. I mean, right. he, he heals many at one point, and then uh, then we get to the the uh, the cleansing of the leper, and even when he's preaching, how they're they're just amazed. The people are just absolutely amazed at what's coming out of his mouth and what's happening in his presence, as these people who they've known for a long time to be uh, ailing and ill, and uh, to all of a sudden, th this man has given them a new hope, uh, a new life through the cleansing that comes from his, uh, from his word, from his mouth. Right, yeah, from, from his mouth, from his authority, right? I mean, we talked about how that, that's immediately what you get in chapter one. It's all about the authority. And it's it's really highlighted in a couple of ways. I, I think that, you know, the, the very last thing that we read, I mean, that was a pretty bold statement of authority. Um, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
Um, but then in the very beginning of the chapter, right, we have the, the other Son of Man authority phrase. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So uh, the chapter is kind of bookend by this question of authority. Um, particularly, though, what exactly does the authority of the Son of Man include? I, I don't think actually we had Son of Man yet. This is, I think, the first time it pops up in Mark. So there is a little bit of a transition here from chapter 1 to chapter 2. Let's just start by looking at this first scene, though, with the paralytic. Um, It's interesting that that Mark sets us up for what's about to happen uh, with a lot of detail, right? Like, it's a very specific scene in Capernaum. And as you were saying, it it just really kind of lends itself to you kind of being able to visualize it and see it in your mind's eye. Um, you know, but yeah, a lot, a lot more detail about the circumstances leading up to what happened um, than, than the scenes in chapter one, right? Right, right. Well, Mark, you know, Mark basically, he's, I mean, the way in which he writes, he just writes, it's kind of like, just give us the facts, Joe. You know, he doesn't really uh, elaborate a lot on, on what, you know, what, uh, what's going on in the, in the story. He just pretty much just gives you the facts, but yeah, here he, he kind of gives us a little bit more. Uh, we can definitely see it's, uh, it's told in a, a little bit broader stroke, uh, as far as the story goes. And, uh, especially this, this healing of the paralytic and, and what's going on here, uh, with people now knowing that this man can cleanse uh, gathering together at this door where he's at, the home that he's at at the time. And uh, and I like this verse in verse 5 where it says, and and when Jesus saw their faith, um, and I, I like that because yeah. he knows he knows the heart, and he already knew, you know, he already knew that these, these folks believe in him, uh, the belief that he is someone that... Uh, could possibly be the one that they're waiting for even because even later on as you go through this story you you see that um you know that's why all of a sudden you know your sins are forgiven son your your sins are forgiven they go wow who is this guy who can even forgive sins um i mean everything that he's doing is amazing them and then to say that and then to actually speak the words uh to this man get up and walk and, you know, take your bed and go home. And and it happens right there in their sight. Um, you can see that, indeed, their, their, their faith and their trust is growing. And you can see it's growing in more and more people as now we're getting crowds that are starting to gather around him here in this story. Thanks. I think that's exactly right, that we're, we're setting we, – we have all this extra detail from Mark, um, you know, and you're right. He is kind of – uh, yeah, he's not super descriptive in a lot of these things, right? Like uh, w- when we had the the cleansing of the man with the demon, for instance, right? I mean, uh, that was back in chapter one. It was just sort of like they went into Capernaum immediately on the Sabbath. He entered the synagogue and was teaching, and, uh, and then it goes on. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, right? It's just kind of like there he right, is, right? right. There, there's right. the guy. <laughs> um, but, but, but here we have all this extra detail, and I think it, you're right. It, it really is building up to verse 5 when Jesus saw their faith, right? Because the idea is, as you were saying, people are hearing about him. Right, and they're and they're beginning to think to themselves, maybe this is the guy. Maybe this is the guy we've been waiting mm-hmm. for. Um, and and they're and they're so eager to get to him, and in fact, they're so confident. They're so. I mean, and that's really the thing, right? They're so confident that they're going to get healing, um, that they're willing to do this, right? Because you wouldn't fight your way through a crowd, right? You you would you wouldn't try like fighting your way through a crowd to get get to this man who's like in this house surrounded by people where there's no room. Where you like you, you tear the roof roof apart <laughs> and lower this guy down, right? Um, like through the roof, right. you wouldn't do all that unless you were pretty sure, right? That 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 you were going to get healing. So I mean, I, I think that that's that's what we're seeing here. Mark's describing all of this so that we, like Jesus, can see their faith, can see the the confidence and the trust that they have, and and, and I think that that really is. For that reason, it's kind of unfortunate that that the title here is, you know, Jesus heals a paralytic um, in our translation, because, you know, like we've been saying in the first chapter, it's not really so much about the miracles. It's about 
what Jesus says, and it's all leading up to this, that our Lord Jesus is forgiving sins. And that's the unique thing here that starts off this new chapter, right? That Jesus sees faith and he forgives sins on account of that faith. I mean, and, and that's, that's the thing that's, that's new, that just jumps out at you and you're like, whoa, okay, chapter two has started off with something even bigger yet in some ways. And then, and then Jesus even makes it bigger whenever he actually identifies himself as the son of man who has authority on earth. And that, uh, that is where the people are really starting to, to gravitate toward, is this, this language that Jesus is starting to use, and then connecting that language with the actual divine, powerful work of the miracle that they see performed in front of them as well. So it's all, it's all culminating right there. And so, I mean, and he's, and he's not, he doesn't just say it this one time, you know, in, with paralytic, but later on, uh, when he's challenged about the Sabbath, and he says it again, you know, he brings that out again, uh, his identification uh, as Son of Man, and and with and with what all that means too, in the hearing of the people. Yeah, well, and and we should and we should talk about that. I mean, that's it's a pretty big point here. Um, the, the Son of Man, right? It comes up here, and. I mean, it's striking, right? Because it comes up really without warning and without explanation, right? I mean, right. Uh, right. And you, you have no reaction from the people either. There, there, there's no like, hey, what do, what do you mean the son of man? Or like, you're calling yourself the son of man? Like, no one says anything like that. Like, it's just, it's just kind of here it is. And, and there's no explanation of, you know, this isn't like John where— Jesus is like, you know, I am the light of the world, right? Or like, you know, I am the good shepherd, right? Like, no, he just he just says that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. It, it um the way it's just kind of put in there is is pretty mysterious. It's it's not like a straightforward identification like the ones that you have in John. Yeah, very good point. Absolutely, um, and of course, you know, if anyone should know what the words son of man are referring to. It should have been these religious leaders who truly knew the word of God and uh, the connection of what son of man, you know, means as far as the one that they're waiting for, the one that's coming. And so that's why I'm saying, I'm, you know, I'm, you, you can't help but, but see that the people are starting to crowd around Jesus uh, with hopes that this, this one who is, who's now, um, actually performing all these very spectacular miracles uh, along with a new language, a new speak that they haven't heard before, um, that that uh, even the, the those that are in charge are starting to now be curious as to uh, who this man is uh, be, and why he's doing what he's doing. You know, I, 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 you can see that they're challenging him uh, but I'm, they're looking for answers is what they are. They're trying to figure out who is this guy and why is he doing these things that are yeah. totally not right. of that they believe is of God. So, Right, yeah. No, it's, um, it's raising a lot of questions, and you know, Jesus is deliberately, I think, not giving them a lot of answers. It really recalls the last scene of chapter 1, where we had you know, the healing of the leper, right? And what, what's he say to the man who's healed? He's like, you know, see that you say nothing to anyone, right? And, and of course, it, it says in verse 45 that the guy went and talked anyway. But the Lord Jesus is deliberately withholding information here, right? He's deliberately being a little cagey. Um, but we got to talk about that a little bit more after the break. Hang on, everybody. We're looking at Mark chapter 2 here on Nice Strong Word, and we'll be right back. This is Dr. Dale Meyer. Have you heard Concordia Seminary's program, Word and Work and Intersection? 
every week. You can hear it on KFUO Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time. We visit with many interesting guests about how the Word of God applies to their daily vocations and ministries. Be sure to tune in and may the intersection of word and work be busy on your corner. Thursday on Issues Etc., we'll talk with demographer Lyman Stone about the history of American religiosity and its recent decline. And we'll continue our series, The Words of Scripture, talking with Pastor Will Whedon about the word goodness in the Bible. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. Hi, I'm Pastor Mark Hawkinson, host of Moments of Assurance Worldwide KFUO. On the next MOA weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to be sharing thoughts with you about the parable of the wedding feast. Jesus said, but when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Well, how do those words apply to you and to me today? I'll talk about it this Saturday and Sunday morning on Moments of Assurance weekend, 745 a.m. Central on Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading Mark chapter 2 today, and we're joined by our guest. We've got Pastor Curtis Dieterding, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, all of our live listeners, this is your chance here. If you've got any questions for me or for Pastor Dieterding, uh, you can give us uh, your thoughts, your questions, comments, uh, via email today, you can email the studio kfuo at kfuo.org, um, and the helpful folks at KFUO will pass along that message to us. Also, if you're following along on uh, Facebook, you can also just post something right there, and I'll, I'll read the question uh, for everybody, and we can answer any questions or comments like that. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so so no no phone calls today though, unfortunately. But that's uh, that's okay. Well, we can still do the email or the Facebook. I'll also, uh, don't neglect to thank our underwriters at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Thank you guys for your work and for supporting Thy Strong Word. Their website is lhfmissions.org. So. Yes, we were just talking about uh, the Son of Man that just kind of comes up here all of a sudden. Um, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, um, and it's even kind of it's even kind of cryptic the way he uh, the way he does it. I think because you know you've got you, 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 so he goes and he says this right, you know about the, about the Son of Man right, um, right. And, and then he follows it up with a miracle right. Um, he hasn't he hasn't followed up with a statement of you know I hey I I really do have authority to to forgive sins or you know I mean you know in, in the holy name of God I, I I do hereby pronounce all your sins absolved right he he just says you know I I say to you rise pick up your bed and go home um, and, and it so it feels like there's a little bit of this uh, this mystery surrounding this like with the the man previously cleansed of leprosy where the Lord Jesus is actually controlling the narrative that's coming out around him. Like, he, he knows that his fame is going to spread. He knows people are going to be coming to him wanting miracles. But he's really, I mean, I, I don't know. He, he seems to be kind of um, turning down the volume here, right? Kind of, kind of. I mean, not, not like putting a stopper in it, but he's controlling the rate at which things are revealed about himself. It's, it's all going to come to a head, right? We're going to get to the cross, but now is not his time. Um, and, and there's this sort of kind of pacing that he has, it seems. Right. And, and of course, we have uh, we've understood that whenever Jesus is asking people, please don't say anything about it. Don't go and tell others about this, that there is a timing that's going on about uh, how quickly people are going to be hearing it, how fast they're going to be gathering um, because of what uh, the uh, gen gentleman did that he had healed earlier, that cleansing um, you know, and, and because he didn't do as Christ asked him to do, and he went and he freely talked about it anyway, it, you know, things spread to the point that um, he couldn't go from town to town without there being a group or, or a crowd of people 
because this right. was pretty phenomenal. Uh, these healings that were that were happening and what Jesus was doing, and I mean, how how was right. how were people going to stop from saying anything when he was healing all those people, even prior to the cleansing of the leper? Um, you know, whenever yeah. he was there, and it says, you know, they brought all to him who were sick and oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered. I mean. Look at all the number of people there. But there is a there is some kind of a timing that is going on because, you know, the people are, are really starting to um, think about him. And of course, we're going to learn this as you as you move through this gospel. We'll learn that uh, they want to make him a king. They and and this this could be a political upheaval that comes way too fast uh, because all the things were going to be timed out uh, to that holy week when uh, when he would be uh, hung as the sacrificial lamb on the cross right right yes yeah, certainly and i and i appreciate you bringing up um you know before uh just about the that we should we should go back and consider you know he's doing these miracles um these are not the only miracles he's performing of course when he cleansed the leper there were already um you know other signs that he was performing whether it was um you know healing simon's mother-in-law or in the case of uh it was it was earlier, right? Casting out the the demon out of the man in the synagogue, right? I I think that when you have then Mark telling us that he sternly charged the leper not to say anything, I think the point is less like, oh hey Jesus like tried to have no one figure out about the leprosy healing, right? But he talked anyway. Like Jesus was like you know kind of face palm like oh yeah, he he talked right. I I I don't think it's that. As much as it is like, actually, we, we're probably to be understanding that the Lord Jesus has actually kind of all along been telling people to keep it to themselves. Um, and, and probably, in fact, I'm guessing that the disciples actually would have kept it to themselves when Simon's mother-in-law, for instance, was healed. So I'm thinking that a lot of people were actually listening to him. Um, but th in this case, right, what is some a kind of word got out this time. Um, so it, it's that idea, right, that, you know, hey, you know, he's uh, he's kind of got a policy of, eh, I don't want to draw attention. And that is slowing the rate at which things are happening. It is actually working to slow um, the rate in the day w when there will be that big confrontation, like you were saying. Um, uh, but but yeah, there is going to be a little bit that's that's leaking out. But this is, I think, what you have in John in uh, chapter 10, where you have this, uh, you know, these, these different uh, moments, right. Where in chapter 10, verse 24, you know, everyone's gathered around him and they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly, right? Like people right. just, they hear mm -hmm. him say these son of man things. And they're just like, what does that even mean? Like, what is, what is he getting at? You know? So, um, so yeah, so, so he is uh, a little bit <laughs> keeping them, in suspense here um but then we, we turn to this next episode with levi and uh in this case right this isn't so much um i mean it's interesting it's it's not so much like you know hey, who is this who has the authority to forgive sins um but it's why, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors right so you know he's uh, Mark has told us about Jesus, our Lord, calling a few of his disciples, but he takes special attention here with the calling of Levi. Yeah, I, I, I like what uh, yeah, I like what Jesus does as far as yeah, uh, what he's doing is challenging, of course, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, with uh, a number of of um, you know laws, rules, and regulations that are more made by man and by those scribes and those Pharisees than what is actually a part of God's will. And so Jesus is bringing that to bear. And he's getting right in their face with it, too. I mean, he's doing things that are very different. You know, when those when those folks all said together, we never saw anything like this, um, that's probably what was going on in the, in the hearts and the minds of the Pharisees time and again. When Jesus would do things just like that, how dare he would eat with tax collectors and sinners, you know. Um, but what I like, too, is in all of this, you know, with the Son of Man language, and now you get to these, these, uh, these statements, these very quick statements that Jesus makes that are like nothing they've heard before. You know, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I mean, that's a phenomenal statement. 
And he goes on to say, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And then as we move through the rest of this chapter, he's got, he does this on, on and on again, you know, about, you know, using different examples uh, about the bridegroom, and the wedding guests, and uh, the wine, and the, and, the, and the old garment. I mean, he is speaking in, in ways that is painting a picture of what is true, what is honest and true uh, compared to what the Pharisees believed to be the, the, the true way to follow God and to, to understand what, what uh, you know, what, what's really um, according to God's will and according to God's laws, you know, because we, they know, they know those laws are a reflection of what's true for us to, as people to live in relationship with God. And so it's just, it's it's wonderful to watch how Jesus, almost every single word now that's coming out of his mouth is, you could just say, well, we never, we never heard anything like this, you know? Um, so, right. yeah, this is, this is taking them, this is taking everyone by storm. It really is. And I like to, um, you know, I, I like what you're saying that, you know, the way he's talking is very different. I, I agree. And it's like when he says this and he says, you know, those who are sick, right? It's interesting because he doesn't say that, right? Like after he heals the paralytic, he doesn't say that after he heals the leper, right? Where it kind of lit- literally would have made sense, right? Um, where he's <laughs> actually healing somebody here. But in this case, right, who is he like healing? Uh, who are the sick people? Well, it's sinners and tax collectors like Levi, the son of Alphaeus, right? So the way that the Lord has connected sickness with sin is, I, is I think, really interesting because I, I don't think he was the first person to do that. I, I think that when you read the first story here um, about the healing of the paralytic, I, I think everybody, I think everyone got what was going on, right? Isn't it interesting, you know, when Jesus sees their faith, right, uh, referring to the, the man, the paralytic, and his friends, you know, he's, the first thing he says is, your sins are forgiven. And no one's like, well, hang on, he didn't ask for his sins to be forgiven, right? <laughs> right? Like, no no one said, like, well, I just wanted to be healed, right? <laughs> like, no, no, no one, no one says anything like that. Um, well, they, they start questioning, what, well, why is he for, why is he forgiving sins, right? Um, but the thing is, everyone already made the connection between sickness and sin, right? I, I think I think that everyone already got that, and I think that there was already a large assumption in the culture that if you had some kind of disease, like um, you know, uh, like paralysis, it was because of sin, right? I mean, that that was like a widely held belief that if you had some kind of long term illness, this is because you were just a, a, a terrible sinner, you had done something terrible, or maybe your parents had done something terrible, right? You think of like uh, in Exodus where the Lord says that uh, the sins of the fathers will be punished uh, on the onto the children's generations to the third and the fourth generation, right? So there's there's this idea that the the sickness and the sin are connected, right? But but that's just the problem. It's like well, if if the sin and the sin uh, the sin and the sickness are connected, well, no one can do anything about the sickness because only God can forgive the sins, right? I mean, I mean, I think that's the, the assumption. It's like, oh, we can't do anything about this then, right? But then Jesus is saying like, hey, look, um, I actually can though, so I can deal with both. I mean, and I, I think that's the thing that's like you were saying, kind of blowing people's minds here. Yeah, yeah, because it just, it just you, can, you, can, you can sense how it's picking up as you see uh, where the people are that are around him, and especially with the scribes and the Pharisees, you can see that as well. I mean, every single one of these stories, uh, every one of these events that we read about here in this chapter, um, there are questions being asked in every single one about, you know, like, why does this man speak like that? Uh, you know, how can, who, who can forgive sins but God alone? Uh, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why do we, John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast. And why are you looking at what's not lawful in the sense? And that's just question after question after. He is he is blowing their minds because he is all of a sudden coming in with an authority that they haven't seen before, and it's it's definitely challenging them. Right, and, and it's you know it's not um 
it's not crazy um, what what they're objecting to, right? I mean, that's the thing. When you take the sickness metaphor of sin, which I think that they were kind of basically operating with, right? Do you go near people who are sick, right? And of course, this is an, an idea that I think a lot of us are kind of familiar with, right? Um, if you know, you've got people sure. who are in quarantine, right? You don't go visit them, right? And so, right. Uh, like, like it says in Psalm 1, you know, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, right? Uh, there's this idea that, you know, if you've got somebody who's, you know, in sin, like these ca- tax collectors and sinners, you know, you, you ought to keep your distance, you know, keep well enough away um, in the same way that you would keep away from a leper, right? Unless you want to also get leprosy, right? Like, so so I think that's that's the thing, you know, we're kind of thinking of it as, oh, you know, these people, like, you got, we got, you know, social distancing here, right? Like, you can't go near them. Um, but it, it's just because of what you said. It's because of the authority of Jesus, that then this connection is just getting like all flipped around, right? So it's not necessarily that the that the connection itself between sickness and sin is new. Like I, I think they got that, you know, and that and that's why it was like, hey, we should just stay away then, right? But it's like, hey, if you're the authority and you can actually do something about the sin, then you can do something about the sickness too, and you don't need to keep your distance. Um, yeah. So so it's again taking us back to the authority, and and as you were mentioning. Um, that comes up again, just almost right away here about about fasting, right? And and this is one where may, maybe we, uh, may, maybe this is the one that's sort of like the one we have the least amount of sympathy with, I guess, John's disciples and the Pharisees, right? Because you know, fasting that's not something we we talk about or think about. I mean, it's kind of making a resurgence with you know intermittent fasting, right? It's a fad, <laughs> but um, religiously, people don't fast as much as they used to. But it's a really big deal for them. So well, why is it such a big deal that, you know, Jesus and the disciples aren't fasting? What, what does that, what does that mean? Well, you know, it's really, uh, th- this is such a beautiful picture that Jesus paints here of what's to come. You know, we, we know now, of course, as New Testament people, when we look at what all of the New Testament uh, speaks about, and especially as Jesus speaks about the bridegroom relationship to the church, the bride, uh, these are beautiful words, and they truly make sense to us here on this side of of everything that he had said back in those days, too, that the, the wedding guests fast, the brood is with them. Can this be? And he's basically saying, absolutely not, because there will be this feast. And so, you know, we now can look at these words and we can go and, and, and see that future wedding banquet that's that's going to that's gonna be prepared for us. I mean, what is it want? one thing that we like to do as God's created people. We like to eat, and we like to eat good food, <laughs> fine food. And, I mean, there, yeah. that's what we usually surround ourselves with when we get together, right? We, we surround ourselves right. uh, around the food, and uh, we look forward to that day when we can just banquet with, you know, eternally yeah. with, our, with, our, uh, with our bridegroom. And so we get this beautiful picture, which, of course, you know, I mean, how many folks that were standing around that actually understood what this was even about? And, and the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and there is a day of fasting in that day. Because when we're not, uh, when we're not there with uh, this this wonderful bridegroom, um, you know, it's it's a sad day, and we are in sorrow. We're we're in, uh, we're, in we're apart from him. The, the whole idea that you talked about earlier, and I'm, 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 I, I'm thinking that you guys probably talked about this yesterday, and that's in Chapter 1, this social distancing of lepers. I, I think that's uh, right. that really does speak to where we're at today. But that's something that also distances us from God is our sin, um, and it, it yeah. keeps us from Him, and, and, and that's why the bridegroom came. And when the bridegroom's here, when we when we uh, have faith in him, when and, and this faith that he sees in these in these folks that were that were there that day, that faith is what draws us to him, and we should be feasting. And that's what he's basically saying: I'm here among yeah. the sinners now. I'm here among those who uh, you now would never dream of eating with or sitting with. And I'm here among them, and they have faith in me. They trust me, and I'm I'm feasting with them because it's time to feast. It's not time to fast. And so, 
uh, he's really, I mean, speaking even in, um, you know, future terms of what's coming, you know, this, this future language that he's using here. Yeah, well, and, um, you know, I, th I think that we saw that in a big way, too, in in Revelation, right, when we're looking at the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? And and that's the, the, the picture, right, that even though it doesn't necessarily look that way or seem that way, you look around and, and, you're, and you're like, really? I don't really see necessarily a lot of reasons to celebrate even, right, by outward appearances. Um, but, you know, we saw that back in, like, chapter 19, the, the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready, right? Um, you know, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, there, there's this language that, you know, we, and I think we often, uh, in our own liturgy, we use the term marriage feast, right? And, uh, of course, that, right. that happens in a big way in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. So, uh, but yes, as, you're, as, you're, as you were saying, though, also literally in the ways of lots of church potlucks, right? Um, but... But yeah, so you know, we I, th I think we're used to this idea that that the church, even right now, as an anticipation of heaven, right, as a participation in heaven now, um, is is in a sense like this feast, and so it's just it's really fascinating. You're right. I think it's a beautiful picture that the Lord paints even in Mark here. So this is one of these again one of these connections between Mark and uh, John Revelation, right, um, where it's like, well, 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 how can you fast? then um you know there, there's a place for fasting we we saw that in in haggai especially right um that you know what when you're observing the destruction of the temple um you know the invasion of jerusalem there there are good reasons to fast um i mean you, you hear in the even in the new testament right um, the apostles talk about fasting right so it, it's not it's not like a bad thing that we, you don't do but you don't fast on easter <laughs> you don't right. you don't right. fast on christmas exactly. day <laughs> it, you know, and it's like, and as long as Jesus is right there, it's Easter Day, it's Christmas Day. You know, I mean, I mean so that's, um, yeah. So I, I think you you really um, summed it up well. Uh, there's a little bit more that could be said here, but I wanted to look at a couple of listener questions here um, that we got via email here. So uh, I think a question here was kind of particularly relating to the scribes here, because we we didn't actually talk about it that much uh, last time either. Uh, the, the scribes have come up a few times. Um, just right now, it was uh, the Pharisees and John's disciples. What's coming up here is, uh, again, going to be the Pharisees. But I think it was back here in verse uh, 16. You had the scribes of the Pharisees. And there in the first episode yes. with forgiving the sins... Right, we had, I think it was, I think it said the scribes there too, if memory serves. Yeah, the scribes, some of the scribes were sitting there, right? So uh, who are these, these scribes people, right? And, uh, you know, how, how does that relate to, uh, this question was like uh, here asking, you know, is that, is that related to scholasticism or, or are these scholars, right? Um, like like how, how, do we, how do we parse out scholarly uh, interpretation and theology Right from the authority of Jesus, I, I I think it's kind of at the heart of the question on, on a certain level, right? I mean, um, you know, people talk about the difference between like, uh, you know, uh, faith and reason. I, I I don't know. So so maybe if you could speak to that a little bit, who are these scribes and what's what's the tension there? Well, that I mean that's I mean that's what you're already referring to. You're referring to the fact that these guys are scholarly, scholarly in the Word of God. You know, these are the the guys that. Um, oversee really that the, that the word of god is kept you know pure in in its uh in the in the copying of you know from one uh from one copy to another copy they you know they make sure that they uh don't uh, make any mistake um you know at least the, the scribe scribal sects of that day um Right. This is what they did. I mean, they knew the word, and to have somebody come in here and now reinterpret that word differently than the way that they have interpreted it and understood it, um, and I think it says something too, very interesting. In that, um, you know, we need to, to make sure that we hear God's word, not necessarily man's interpretation of that word, because that could be new laws, right. new guidelines, new ways of living that are really truly apart from God. 
And so, yeah, this this is pretty significant in the sense that they're they're and just like I said earlier, they're being challenged. You know, like they've never been challenged before. You know, Jesus right. is coming right at them with this. And uh, when right. they thought they had it all right, um, they're now discovering that. Well, they're not discovering it, but Jesus is pointing out that you don't. You know, this is not uh, the relationship that God wants with His people. Uh, this is not right. uh, how God wants us to deal with one another. And so He goes right to the sinners. He goes right to those uh, who are tax collectors, those who are seen as low lives in the in the society. And He goes He goes to them to now bring to them um, the hope that uh, God loves them, too, and has compassion upon them as well. And uh, so that's, you know, we're starting to see Jesus doing this now. Uh, This is the very reason for which he came, was to forgive sins, you know, that we might be restored back to, uh, that was his mission, to be restored back uh, to um, a relationship with God. Yeah, and, and I think that that's what you just said is the key there, the love and the forgiveness that, I mean, this reminds me of um, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he talks about, you know, I can have like all wisdom and knowledge, right? And all these gifts in the spirit and like tongues and insight and interpretation, right? But if I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong and I'm a clanging cymbal, right? And, and, I, and I think this is kind of basically what the Lord's getting at with this wineskin analogy, right? Like, you know, if, if you're not, if you're not going to love people, if you're not actually praying you know, for for these sinners and tax collectors, if you're not actively seeking their good and their blessing, um, then, you know, all your scholarly learning and insight and erudition, it, it's like an old wineskin that just can't take this new wine that I'm pouring, right? Because the new wine is the wine of his love and compassion and ultimately his passion, right? I mean, so, which is all about love and forgiveness. So, I mean, I, I think that the Lord Jesus isn't coming in here and saying like, oh, well, you must reject the way of reason, uh, no, no, do not come to me with your intellect and your, your rationality. Come to me with, you know, trust and childlike faith. No, I don't think that's actually the, the tension. Um, I, I think the idea is that they've got all this learning, which is a good thing, right? Because it took, it took uh, a lot of learning to be able, I know it sounds funny, but the people who were copying the manuscripts, right, and who were the scribes, right, you had to have a really good familiarity with ancient languages and theology and all the rest um, to be able to make sure that you were uh, doing that the right way so that you could actually catch a mistake, right? So, yeah, I, I don't think he's actually criticizing their learning. I don't. I, I mean, I think the Lord wants us to worship him with our minds, right? Um, but the thing is, that can all uh, whitewash and mask an unloving heart, right? And so I, I think I think what the Lord calls us to is ultimately uh, both. Now, with only one minute left here, uh, we got to take a look at specifically here this Lord of the Sabbath idea, because I think this is kind of like the uh, big case of what we just said, right? Because there was lots of learning and there were lots of rules and interpretations that said you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. Like, what does work mean? And there was a lot of really intelligent discussion that was going on about what you could and couldn't do, scholarly insights, right, interpretations. Um, but Jesus is like, hey, but guys, the thing is you've missed the heart of the matter. So just maybe 30 seconds here. Um, yeah, what do you think that, that key uh, meaning there is of the Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath? Yeah, I, you know, again, you know, they're trying to, to establish, they're, they're going back to rules and that they have developed and that they had uh, put, put together. And, and Jesus is basically saying, actually, the one that's above all of everything, including the Sabbath itself, is our God, uh, and 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 of course he's he's marking himself out here as the Son of Man again. Um, he is the one. He's the great physician who has come to heal sinners, to uh, bring them back, like I said, into a relationship with God in heaven, and uh, and to to set them on a path, knowing that um, God is bringing the power, the forgiveness of sins into this world, right. to this one called Son of Man, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, amen. They, they, they've got it after all their scholarly erudition, they've got to hold this up and say, hey, is this loving people? Is this putting the Sabbath for man? If it doesn't pass the law of love, got to go back to the drawing board. Thank you so much, brother, for helping us break down this chapter, Mark chapter 2. God bless you and the rest of your Easter season and all your people there in Fort Myers, brother. Yeah, it's always a joy. Stay safe and sound. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. Everybody, that was Pastor Curtis Dieterding, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Moving on to Mark chapter 3, more healing, more controversy. Stay tuned. I'm Pastor AJ Espinosa. Until next time, peace. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.